Hey everyone, um, so this is week three of Frugal Fundamentals workshop. The theme is um, investing. Um, we got good friend William Hesmer, a um, little context, William Hesmer, former MLS champion, goalkeeper, all-star, um, and now he's a financial professional based in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, doing amazing things, um, helps a number of athletes, uh, high net worth individuals, uh, individuals in the healthcare space. Uh, so we thought it would be great for him to get uh, on the call, um, you know, talk about more, talk more about investing, talk more about how he's um, helping athletes during this time. Um, obviously, you know, some athletes are dealing with possible pay cuts, some athletes work stoppage, um, just trying to figure out this whole situation with COVID-19. Um, so we're going to leave it open floor, but we're going to do it like how we've been doing it in the past. Um, questions. If you have any questions, you make, uh, make sure to uh, type them in the chat box. Also, in terms of um, you know frugal fundamentals, we partnered with Jonathan Van Horn, uh, life coach, character coach, works with a number of different teams across multiple leagues. Um, so he has the Shift program, and essentially it's a program that helps athletes identify their purpose, you know, outside of their sport. So you know, af after the conclusion of the talk, we're going to let him come on, and um, that's essentially it. But William, thank you so much for joining. Really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Moby. Yeah, no problem. So I want to start off. Um, what, like, like, how did you get into your your career? Like, because I know you wanted to be a lawyer when you stopped, and then you got into financial, uh, being a financial professional. Yeah, good question. So way back when, two thousand eight, the financial crisis is hitting, um, and I was pretty certain I was going to be done playing uh, at the end of that year and go to law school. Um, had some more soccer success. Uh, we won a championship, got a little uh, taste of the U.S. national team. Uh, so decided to stick with soccer for a little while longer. Um, in return, uh, how was I going to spend my time? How was I going to continue to educate myself? I went and met with the director of finance at Ohio State. I uh, told him I had a little scholarship money from the NCAA and ACC that I'd like to use. Um, I loved the stock market. I loved investing. Um, and thought uh, maybe an MBA would be a good path for me. Uh, he quickly talked me out of it, ironically. Um, <laughs> Wait, why? He, he told me, uh, he's like, you know what? And here, here, you know, here he is, one of the professors, and said, hey, listen, you, know, you don't know what you want to do. You don't know exactly where you want this to take you. It's probably not right for you. And uh, it's a lot of money to invest into an MBA. Um, and in your profession currently and what you're chasing uh, over the next two years, um, you might get traded. And if you're traded, these credits likely won't transfer. And will you ever see that out? I'm not sure. Um, and instead, he took me through a, a, a pretty rigorous exercise of what do you enjoy doing? What are your traits? You know, um, where do you see yourself, uh, you know, finding energy? And uh, I think one of the first things I told him is I know I don't want to be a financial advisor. You know, <laughs> so, didn't, didn't trust the guys I'd, I'd enjoy. I just didn't, you know, didn't like their models, didn't like uh, my experiences there, which had forced me to go learn a lot of the planning and the investments uh, uh, and, and followed the markets. And then he set me up with a group out of Columbus, Ohio, uh, a firm called Boudreaux, Shulin and Rowe. And I went and, um, uh, with his introduction, got me in, in the door with their leader, uh, their founder, their CEO, and um, I was privileged to shadow him for a day. Uh, I was a 30-year-old starting goalkeeper for the you know our MLS championship team, and I begged him uh, for an unpaid internship with his 18-year-old Ohio State freshman. Um, he laughed at me and said, uh, hey, we'll take you legally. We have to pay you something. We'll pay you minimum wage. Uh, quit whenever you want to quit. We won't be offended. And uh, I stuck at it for two years. Guys made fun of me uh, for going into practice every day in the suit and tie where they rolled out in their pajamas. Um, but uh, yeah, I found something I loved. I found a passion and it just came from, uh, you know, the five to six hours of free time most athletes have in the afternoons. No, I think the biggest thing right there is just understanding, like investing in your time, investing in your resources and investing in figuring out what you want to do. Obviously, we touched on our, um, our partnership with Jonathan Van Horn and a lot of the things you just said speak to, you know, finding out, you know, your purpose. So when you talk to athletes, like what's the most important thing when it comes to investing? 
Well, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of important pieces that go into it. Um, first, do you have the capacity to invest, and the capacity to invest in, in in really two ways? Do you have the risk tolerance? Do you have the stomach? Because um, as we've seen as of lately, uh, it can be trying. Mm-hmm. Um, second, do you have the cash necessary to let go of for a long time horizon? The, the time horizons that it requires to get some decent risk reward returns. Um, and once they can go through both of those exercises and then develop their purpose of investing and, you know, general wealth accumulation is, is a fine purpose. Um, I think at that point in time, it's, it's, it's a good time to consider uh, putting some money into the markets. So like with this current situation, you know, you have, you know, have people that are trying to just hold the fort. And then you have people like, okay, I have some capital. Where can I kind of take advantage? So how do you get there, like the overall mindset to think like long-term? Well, we believe strongly in a more of a planning-led uh, investment process. Um, back to the risk capacity, uh, back to the time horizons, uh, and back to the objectives. Uh, if uh, if an athlete wants to buy an engagement ring in, in November and is looking to invest those proceeds, that's probably not a smart move. Uh, it's, it's likely going to be a very bumpy ride from now to November. However, if that athlete says, I, I've saved this, you know, $100,000, um, I don't I don't want to touch this money for 10 years. I want uh, to invest it. I want to set it and let it grow. Uh, I think right now is, is a very good time and probably a good strategy for that is dollar cost averaging it into the markets. Okay. And when it comes to like um, different formats, you know, right now startup investing is really popular. Um, You know, real estate's really popular. How do you guys, you know, help athletes understand the different ways? I know we spoke earlier off record like there's so many different ways to invest but you got to figure out what works for your personal like profile right yeah exactly um you know the key in it all is diversification uh, across the board being being broadly diversified and that means diversified between various asset classes whether that's real estate you know startups uh, large cap blue chip stocks um uh, so, you know, diversification is, is, is key there in the asset classes. It's also key in your liquidity. Uh, a lot of guys get caught investing early on in very illiquid investments. You know, your, your, your private placement deals, whether it's real estate, startups, and, and not knowing, hey, I might need that money, and then they're not able to access it. And, and especially right now, getting caught in that trap. So understanding the diversification and understanding your liquidity needs. Yeah. And then can you dive into that a little bit more? Because like liquid and emergency fund, like, you know, how important it is to have cash on hand. Right. And so that goes back to step one of investing, in our opinions. Uh, if anybody calls us and says, hey, I'd like to invest, our first process, which is sometimes awkward uh, for that athlete, because we, get, we go a little bit deeper than they expect us to go. <laughs> Uh, is okay. How much cash do you have? And, you know, some are naturally like that's none of your business, man. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, <laughs> and so we're, just, you know, what we're trying to find out is, uh, are you liquid enough, especially right now, especially uh, during a pandemic or any any crisis of of, of, uh, of the markets? Um, are you liquid enough to withstand six more months of not getting paid? If uh, you know. MLS decides not to pay, pay their players. Um, do you have enough cash to do all the things you need to do? And it's not just your own personal living expenses. It's also if you've invested in something that's going to have some capital requirements. Um, if you've got a, a rental property that now you're worried that your tenant's not going to pay rent, how are you going to keep that mortgage afloat and keep that investment alive? So digging deep into your cash flow uh, and income needs, and, and, and when and where you might need cash over the next really six to 12 months, I think right now is critical. And once you can come up with that number of how much cash you think in a, in, in a worst case scenario you'll need, then you start looking at that excess cash and say, okay, do, do we still feel comfortable deploying this money knowing that I could substantially go lower from here? And it might be two to three years before I see a payoff. I think that's a great point. 
sorry, my, my shout is a little shaky, but I think that's a great point that you made about understanding, like, you know, just like from my personal experience, athletes, we always just see, like, if I put this money in, all right, this is how much I could possibly make. And instead of like all the barometers that, you know, like if, what if it doesn't pay, like worst case scenario. Um, and you mentioned something earlier, like when the athletes are kind of reserved when they, when you have open questions with them, can you talk about the process of like finding a financial professional, you know, someone that's, you know, trustworthy and credible to help handle you, handle your money at the end of the day? Yeah, great question. So as we know, athletes have historically um, and, and, and sadly and unfortunately uh, run into issues uh, with predators, naturally. Young young folks, uh, so oftentimes naive, uneducated about investments, have just haven't had enough time and learning and life experience. Uh, so they're preyed on. Um, so it's really important in our opinion uh, that you, you hire someone that is highly credentialed first of all, uh, which means they've taken a higher standard than most to be a financial advisor. And that means a certified financial professional or planner. Uh, so CFP, look for those marks. Look for the CFA marks. Um, a CPA is a good, a good mark to know. Uh, and even a JD or an attorney. Uh, on all of those cases, you know that there's a college degree and there's a higher ethical commitment uh, to be held as a fiduciary. And really fiduciary is the key word uh, you want to make sure you always ask your advisor or whoever you're going to hire to consult you on your financial management. Uh, if they do not say 100% of the time they act as a fiduciary, um, we highly suggest you run for the hills. Um, a, lot <laughs> even, a lot will even act as a fiduciary 99% of the time, but it's that 1% where they you know, skim them on the, uh, some private placement deal or sell them something they just don't need uh, where they just have to act in a suitable fashion. Uh, so I think that's two. And then the third one, which is by far more important, uh, in my opinion, is can you really fully trust them with everything? Because there will be times in your life where you need to uh, give them every bit of detail around the circumstances so they can model it, uh, give you the science, the data, the modeling behind that decision and issue, but also the art. Because uh, as you know, Moby, you can, you can win a soccer game playing a lot of different formations, right? Uh, and uh, our world's no different. You can win in a lot of different ways in finding that person who can build that plan for you it's, it's not just a successful plan, but that's a successful plan that you can actually stick to, understand, and achieve. Uh, that, that only happens with trust. So that, that is, in our opinion, the biggest. No, I think it's really important how you emphasize you because at the end of the day, uh, it's your money. So um, can you talk, like, is there any other question that you, like, ask? You know, obviously, fiduciary, also obviously build that trust. But is there some, like, set of questions like from a financial terminology standpoint that athletes or any individual can ask to help get clarity? I would also make sure, especially for young athletes, that they're doing two other things um, that may not be typical for them. Um, one, that they're providing detailed planning, mm -hmm. uh, cash flow analysis, they're helping them understand the taxation and and always it's it, you know it's not what you make it's what you save and just like when you invest it's not what your real return is or nominal return it's what your real return is you know after inflation after tax after cost um so understanding the difference and so that the second part of that is just education mm -hmm. um, making sure that they are educating you along the way and uh be like my three-year-old just ask why a lot why <laughs> why 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 and somebody that won't give you that time and understanding again uh I, we think that's troublesome find somebody who will help you understand because it's advantageous for both parties the more you understand in critical times like this the better you're going to stick with that plan the better your performance is going to be the better your result uh so the more you, and then obviously from our end as the advisor the more our client understands the less time we have to do explaining that's and, true the, you know, going over it again, um, which we enjoy, but at the same time, it helps both parties. And then you mentioned um, that, you know, you were already into investing um, prior to getting involved, like from a career standpoint. Were there any resources or like, you know, avenues that you took, like from like books that you'd recommend uh, for people that are interested in getting into investing? 
Yeah, I, uh, I think um, the intelligent investor was, was my baby mm -hmm. uh, by Benjamin Graham. I thought that was a, f a phenomenal book. Um, after that, just y y truthfully, investing for dummies. Yeah. Just go find, you know, you're investing for dummies and get, get familiar with layman terms and start off very, very, very basic. Um, and you really don't need to go much diff uh, deeper than that. Um, you know, as, you, as your wealth starts getting grander and you start getting into higher classes, sure. Um, but in the early days, if you can just understand those basic fundamentals of, of profit and loss statements, you know, reading a balance sheet, uh, what's the difference between a qualified account and non-qualified account, uh, understanding the various tax rates in our country, and where is the optimal income coming in at the lowest tax rate currently? And where are those more tax deferred vehicles and investments? Um, you know, you, you start to position yourself in, 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 in that uh, just basic lineup. Um, you'll start realizing how, how, de how deep you can go in, in any of those given holes. Um, but you really don't need to. If you, you know, and sadly in investing and fortunately investing, you know, being average is really good. That's uh, that's a great point. How you said, like, my, it's like sports. You know, you got to get the basics down first, and then once you get the basics down, you kind of can expand and specialize in certain things that you, um, you know, are keen to. And then we talked earlier. You know, I was asking you a bunch of questions, like, yo, so how do you deal with athletes that want to do real estate, want to do this, want to do that? And uh, you mentioned like there's so many different ways to get into real estate. There's so many different ways to get into startups. So can you like emphasize? Like, for example, like if I want to get into real estate, I can invest without, you know, having to get a mortgage, like through stocks. And like, how do you, like, how do you go about that, that journey? Yeah, it, it, back to the, back to the planning led in investment thesis. That's where it all begins. We've got a lot of clients um, who, who would wildly prefer, prefer investing directly into real estates, meaning owning the, the real estate directly themselves, owning a rental property, owning a duplex, owning a commercial or a strip center. Um, that's just their personality. And it might be that that's what they know, that's what they understand. It might be the fact that, you know, they need to protect themselves from themselves. They know if they could push a button in the market and get that $100,000 out in times like this, they would. And they, you know, they wouldn't hold on to that investment long term. Um, you know, they don't, they like not having to hear about the price of their investment every day like you do right now with the markets or owning a stock. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it, it's just, you know, personal preference. And ultimately, the, the hard part about owning real estate is that illiquidity and that unknown cash flow need that, and, and maintenance costs that you could come have. So, you know, you, you go through uh, with an athlete, okay, here's the pros, here's the cons, like there are with every investment. So with athletes, you know, um, you know, Tennessee starting businesses, you know, starting different ventures, um, like in terms of like a checklist, like in terms of things that you need to know, you know, you mentioned cash flow, uh, you mentioned like planning, like what are some other things that someone should look out for, like as like an athlete entrepreneur? We always start with risk first in any of that. What are your risks? How, you, you know, you've built this incredible um brand name for yourself. Uh, you know, you've built an incredible net worth now, maybe it's second or third contract. They've got the opportunity to, to go jump on an amazing idea in, in, in a startup. It's, it's how could this startup uh, implode the rest of your wealth and brand? Uh, what, what things do we need to make sure that we can protect you on? Um, and so that's, that's the attorney uh, as part of the team. That's also the insurance professional as part of the team. It's, okay, how can we mitigate any any risk here as well as the legal, and then it's and then it's to the CPA uh, probably. And hey, what's the best way uh, uh, for the athlete to own this business? And should it be an LLC? Should it be incorporated? Should it be a partnership? How should he be taxed? Should he own it? Should he own it in his kids' names? Um, and then you know, then we get to that point. At, uh, back in our hands and it's looking at all right if if this thing doesn't make it in year five and we're still having to put you know a couple hundred grand in it a year to keep it going uh we might have to then say enough is enough and and that's all we could afford to speculate on this 
that's a great segue, like understanding when enough is enough. So in 2008, you said you were ready to retire. You know, you kept playing on, I think like three or four more years. Um, that's not always the case for athletes. You know, sometimes it just ends on like off an injury, coach's decision, whatever. How do you guys plan, uh, help athletes plan for that like from a retirement perspective? Oh, great question, Amobi. Um, I think it's getting easier for guys to continue their education and knock out the college degree. Um, I think it will be even easier now uh, from a lot of the universities guys are coming from uh, with more school sports to go online. Um, so one is, is obviously education. If, if, if you don't know what, where um, you want to, uh, to be or what you want to study or what you want to focus on, just keep learning. Just keep the education train rolling. Uh, in fact, a lot of times we tell our clients, you know what, you're best, instead of investing, you're better off investing this money in yourself. You're better off paying $25,000 this year to finish this degree. Um, that, that education, we think, is, is, is the best investment they can make in themselves. And then the second best, I think, is just going and doing. Um, you know, going and getting hands-on. Uh, you love, you know, craft beer, go to a brewery that will let you watch how, how the business works. Uh, you love accounting, uh, go sit, go sit with a CPA during the tax season. Um, you know, you whatever, accounting after that though. Right. <laughs> uh, and so go find whatever that passion is and go get hands on with it. And then third, find a mentor, find somebody uh, who is exceptional. Cause that, I would imagine a movie, you're the same way you got to your successes in life by finding somebody probably on and off the field uh, that could guide you to the highest level. Um, who knew how to take you there that would bet on you, that would spend time with you, uh, find a mentor. Um, that, uh, that for me was invaluable. No, I think that's, that's, that's amazing. Like the three things you said have nothing to do with like investing or like in terms of like stock market or anything like that. It's like investing in yourself and taking advantage of the resources that you have as athletes. And obviously the people in this chat, um, whether they're athletes or not, they're involved with the athletes. Um, so getting them to understand that, the first thing you can do, the first step you can take is understanding yourself as a person and then investing, um, investing from there. So once again, William, we really appreciate you taking the time. We're going to leave the, uh, the floor open for questions. Um, if anyone's comfortable to ask, go ahead. Um, but before uh, William answers, we just got to make a disclaimer that it's important to consult. He's going to try to answer the questions as best as possible. Um, but obviously, with the lack of information um, in terms of numbers, we may not be able to give you what you're looking for in terms of, um, how can I say, well, um, direct response. Right. Any, <laughs> any, I got to be careful with any very specific guidance without, uh, without full information. So uh, okay. I apologize in advance if I can't answer too directly. Yeah. So, so you can't tell me what stocks I, want. I should pick it. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. That's right. But yeah, floor's open. In the meantime, we're going to let uh, Jonathan come on and tell him more about, because you guys know each other, uh, more about um, the shift program. If I can figure out this, this thing real quick. There we go. But once again, also uh, for the people that may have came late, this will be also on YouTube recorded. Um, and uh, at the end of the six-week session, so just letting you guys know ahead of time. Uh-oh. Did I do it? He's moving around. Yeah, I think he's there. Yeah, I'm good. All right, perfect. Well, it's good to, good to see you. Good to see you, Jonathan. Yeah, uh, I'm going to thank you very much for, uh, again, partnering with you in this in this, in this fundamentals. It's been uh, it's exciting seeing just the, pro the, the progress that, uh, that you've been in the last few weeks and the people you've been able to have on. And again, I'm honored to be able to partner with you uh, with uh, the SHIFT course. Uh, SHIFT is uh, focus on assisting athletes in the midst of transition, successful transition in life and in sport. And what SHIFT does, it creates a framework uh, to help athletes and people navigate transition. Just like in sport, transitions are essential to be successful individually and as a team, uh, but also in life. And uh, SHIFT has created a framework to be able to help in that transition. That starts a lot with understanding who you are, uh, what makes you tick your story, as well as uh, what your why is, what your passion, and what, your, what gets you excited and what gets you up in the morning, clarifying those things. And also, Will, something that you mentioned a bit as well is understanding where is it you want to go. 
And I think one of the hard things with the professional athletes, especially, is that they've been doing their sport their entire life. It's been their dream. And thought of even doing something beyond their sport is it's just sort of it's like crazy. Uh, but having something and then trying to just start to explore. And that's what SHIFT is all about, helping athletes explore in that process and then some goal setting and really work on your daily habits to be successful in the midst of that transition. So, again, honored to be a part of uh, all that we're doing with the app, a frugal athlete. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan, for that. And, William, since people are shy, I want to ask you a question. So okay. when you decided to finally go um, on as a financial advisor, what was it like getting your first client? Um, it was, uh, a little bit nerve wracking on uh, your, I had trained with a group. I was, you know, took a year basically to build my business before taking on a client. Um, but it's like your first game. I mean, you've done it, you've done it a thousand times. Um, but now it's, now it's real. Now you're live. Now it's all on you. Um. And uh, I remember a first, the first few trades that you're entering, you know, putting in some big numbers into the market and, and, and getting a little butterflies the first, <laughs> the first time you're doing it. No different than, uh, you know, the first time you, you walk out under the lights and the music and the fans. It's, uh, uh, I mean, I'm fortunate to love, love my second act, if you will. And, then, you know, the butterflies kind of the same feeling. So can you talk about that dynamic of like going from player in the locker room, people know about you like, or played with you, played against you to like having them trust you to handle their money? Cause you know, there's a, like a dynamic with athletes. Like, like you said, like, why do you need to know what's in my pockets? So like, how does that work? Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's just something I'm not shy about. It's uh, you know, it's, Hey, you know, we're going to, we're going to be nosy. Uh, we're going to dig deep. Uh, sometimes you might not like what we say, um, but hopefully that's why you're hiring us. Uh, but we always preface it with, Hey, listen, you're the CEO, you're the boss. This is your money. Uh, it, it, it's our job as the CFO effectively, uh, to, to help you make smart decisions and to get you on a path that you understand and that you're comfortable with, uh, for the long haul. And, and as long as we keep that relationship crystal clear, um, you know, it's, it just goes back to the trust, make sure you're doing the right things and, and, and just doing what you're saying you're going to do. Yeah, that's important. Because I've always been interested in that. So thank you for answering. And then a question from the, the chat, and thank you so much, Adrian. As professional athletes yourselves, you've probably seen the higher risk appetite that traditionally seen by professional athletes. What are some of the pitfalls that you would advise athletes to look out for specifically with their finances? Paying yourself first is a big one that comes to mind for when the career is over. Savings are substantial. Yeah, good question. So, um, you know, I think, I think the risk appetite is, is difficult. We see guys on both sides of the spectrum, especially in, uh, in the soccer world. Um, and, uh, you know, guys who are uh, alpha males, you know, pedal, pedal down all the time. I want highest return. Um, we try and back them down and we'll model it out and we'll show them, hey, listen, to be incredibly wealthy, with the amount of money you have at this age, you just simply do not need to take that amount of risk. You've effectively already won a lottery ticket in, in, in a small way. Um, if you are just average with these dollars, you know, these are the, these, these are the net worth numbers you could have by age 40 at which you and potentially your children are financially free. You know, why would we go, you know, trying to shoot down every grand slam home run when all we need to do is really hit singles. Um, so you've got guys naturally like that on the field, your forwards, your, your tens who are, they're paid to take risks. They're paid to take chances. They just want to take chances and all they need to hit is one out of 10. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, you've got your, you know, your less risk averse, your, your center backs. Um, and quite often they're foreigners. They're, they're, they're athletes that are new to the American system. They've maybe come from a country uh, that their economic uh, situation in that country was not as stable. You know, the idea of investing in anything, even the idea of putting your money in a bank might be crazy. So understanding for them that no, they, they can't just sit on cash. You know, cash loses purchases, purchasing power year over year to inflation. You know, you, you kind of got to invest. You need to invest. You can invest in, you know, it's the, been one of the um, greatest engines of wealth creation uh, 
in, in our capitalist society. Um, you should, and especially at your age. And so educating them even more to say, hey, step up the risk. Um, and as long as you model it, again, back to this planning-led investment process, model it out and just show guys, hey, listen, if you only get a 5 6% return uh, each year with a 60-40 you know, stock bond portfolio, uh, you know, you're going to have a, a nine-figure net worth potentially by age 60, um, you know, for some of these new, new contracts that are out there. Yeah, and you start, <laughs> you, start, you start showing them those numbers, and man, it's uh, it's quickly eye opening to them to say, okay, maybe I don't need to take as much risk, but from time to time, bring something interesting to. Yeah, I love the financial modeling piece. Like as an athlete, when you can see it and like goal set, I think that is way easier to teach. And I like the analogy about you know home runs versus singles. So like staying on base, you know, as an athlete, you have that head start. So why risk you know you know swinging out at the plate when you if you just get on base, you're you're good. Uh, another question is uh, from Taryn, and she was she was on our first week when we spoke about money management. Uh, when screening clients, what are some of your red flags that someone is not a good fit to work with you? You know, we talked about athletes, you know, working with financial advisors, but from the financial advising perspective with athletes. Yeah, great question. Uh, I think the first one is fit uh, and trust. Um, and so it, it, do we feel like this person is, is disclosing everything to us? Do we feel like they are, are, are hiding something? Uh, do they, do we feel like they're going to actually take our advice? Um, you know, or is this just going to be a combative relationship? Um, you know, in, in a lot of situations, somebody's just not ready to invest yet. They, they, they don't have that risk capacity yet. They're not willing as Warren Buffett said this weekend, uh, they're not willing to, to own an investment and watch their investment get chopped in half, potentially in the short term. Um, you know, it's, so it, it's a hard process and, and not one that we're perfect with. Um, but as you know, Moby, you know, you're in a locker room with 30 guys. Uh, you can get along and be professional with 30 guys. You're not going to be best friends with all 30 guys and all 30 guys are not going to be good fits for us as clients. Oh, that's a good <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, to add on that question, has, like, has there ever been a situation where you had to be like, you know what, you're not, you're not ready. You need to, um, you need to sit back and really analyze what you want, you know, from a money perspective, like with the client. A lot, a lot. Um, oh, wow. So we're fortunate. Uh, we're fortunate to um, do uh, the financial uh, symposium, um, as you know, do the financial literacy. Uh, classes. So we get a lot of those rookies who call us um, and, uh, and, 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 and are ready to invest and are ready to do the, the right things. Um, and uh, it may be, maybe even somebody who's new to the league. Um, and they're just not at the emergency fund target yet that they need to be at. Mm -hmm. uh, they maybe have some excess debt. Maybe it's student debt. Um, maybe it's just some bad credit card debt. Um, and we want to see them put their money in their 401k first before they, before it gets to us. We want to see them knock out a few other things, you know, spend money on school, uh, whatever it might be, um, before they're, before they're investing dollars for, for a long term. No. And, and how do you feel as a, how do you feel advising a professional athlete differs from your more typical client? Do you start them down a different path? Yeah, it's, it is, it is so much different. Um, you know, that's why we started uh, our firm sporting wealth partners. It's, it is, uh, it is a totally different animal, uh, advising and managing money and planning, uh, for, uh, an athlete than it is for your regular worker for so many different reasons. Um, and your general investing rules of thumb, uh, that most, you know, 25, 30 year olds can go by, uh, don't make sense, uh, for a young athlete, um, for a lot of different reasons and their cash flow needs, uh, at 35 and 40 are going to be different. Their, uh, you know, the income that they're earning in their second career is going to be wildly different. The planning opportunities they have, uh, during their career, after their career are, are, are very unique. And a lot of it is just flipped on its head. Um, so, uh, you know, that's why we think it's so important, uh, that a, a, an athlete hires some, someone, some type of advisor consultant, uh, 
that really, really understands the uniqueness of their situation and, and has historically managed money for athletes. Yeah, I would say it's almost like a blessing and a curse as an athlete. You're making, you know, that 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 big portion of your money at this at this unique age where it's hard to tell a young guy or a young gal, like, you know, think long term. Like you at the top you feel like you're at the top of your career. Um, but like to have that aspect. But um uh, you mentioned your time um, you know, helping out the rookie symposiums, the young kids from MLS. Uh, uh, thank you so much for mentioning that because I forgot to talk about it. Can you talk about the stark evolution from when you first started helping out till to now, like the most recent uh, symposium? And like, do you feel like financial literacy is starting to like seep into the minds of these younger athletes or is it still a problem that, you know, we still got to put more effort into? No, it's a great question, Amobi. It has been unbelievable to see the rise of this symposium and, and, and see the uh, financial literacy across the entire locker room, in, in our opinion, uh, where, it, where it is now compared to when I was a player. Um, when I was a player and a, a, a player associate uh, representative for the Players Association and on the executive board, that was my baby. Uh, the league would, as you know, send in guys who would talk to us about finances and supposed to talk to us about financial literacy. Uh, and gosh, I remember some of them. They were so bad. Uh, yeah, people would be like that. So, so off topic, you know, a completely uh, irrelevant uh, in so many ways to, to our situations. Um, and so that was my baby. And so in 2012 or so, um, when I retired and, and started my own gig, it was, you know, hey, how can I continue to build this? How can we continue to build this? And we tried and we tried on our own. There just wasn't enough bandwidth. Until recently, I think the league and now the PA, uh, especially the league, they're now taking it very seriously. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for 10 years, I, I, I knocked on the door saying, hey, guys, we've seen the problems the other sports league, leagues have had. Uh, let's get ahead of this. Let's, let's get this culture now started in locker rooms now that it is cool to be, you know, to manage your money well. It's not cool to be flashy with your money. Uh, you know, it's cool to sit around uh, the locker rooms and um, and talk about, you know, hey, how are you, how are you feeling during this uh, crisis? You know, what are you doing when you're feeling stressed about your financial plan or your portfolio being down 30%? And, you know, if you've got somebody to say, hey, man, just remember long term, just remember long term, just remember how blessed we are to be doing what we're doing. Uh, there's, you know, people out there who are more shaped than us. And, hey, just just stick to your plan. You'll be fine. And so I think those those conversations are happening. Um, and so it's great. It's great to see where it's come. And I give uh, I give the league and the Players Association a, a, a ton of credit because this is not a pocket cost. It does not really, uh, you know, in their minds, I, I disagree, uh, increase the product on the field. Yeah, no, I, th I think it does because, you know, when you're less stressed about, you know, financial certainties, um, you're able to perform better. So um, having like the shoulder, like you said, to like lean on during, you know, conversations, it, it really, it really helps. And like, as you can to attest to, I remember my rookie year or my early years, conversations like this weren't being had and uh, now like with the efforts of you um mls mls pa um it's continuing to get better and um it's 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 great you know as contracts increase um it's more it's even more important than ever so uh once again william thank you so much uh where can the audience find you if you know someone has any has like private questions that they may want to ask or you know different things that you can kind of put them on yeah, William.Hesmer at RaymondJames.com, uh, William.Hesmer at RaymondJames.com. Send me an email, uh, anything personal that you didn't feel comfortable asking in the group setting. Uh, a little chaotic now, but I promise I'll get back to you. Um, and SportingWealthPartners.com, uh, that gives us, that gives uh, most of our information and, and what we do, how we do it. Again, SportingWealthPartners.com. No, thank you so much, William. Thank you so much for all the guests that tuned in. Once again, thank you, Jonathan. Um, for anyone that wants to learn more, I sent uh, the links in the chat. Um, if you want to check out the, the webinar, the virtual workshop, it'll be on YouTube at the end of the six-week um, virtual frugal fundamentals. Um, this week was investing. Next week, we're going to focus on uh, networking. So I'm excited about that, just as, 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 just as I was excited about today. And uh, thank you so much, William, someone I follow and admire. And I really appreciate you taking the time on a Friday. So.
Uh, I know you got some uh, homework and PE teaching to do. So <laughs> That's right. Have a good weekend, Moby. I appreciate it, man. Keep up the great work. Yes, sir.